So I think we're just waiting for Jeff, but while I do that, I think I'll share uh, the agenda. And so let me see if I can share screen here. Okay, so um, there's sort of two slides to go over our agenda and I'm, I'm gonna kick it off you know, in the first 10 minutes and just talk about the work that we've done to date. Um, and then we're gonna go into the vice chair reports. Actually, I'm sorry, this is last week's. So here we go. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, review last week's um, cohort meeting. I think that I'll go ahead and do that because it'll be sort of um, redundant anyway. Uh, so what we've done is gone over our milestones um, in the past four cohort meetings, three cohort meetings last week, and uh, also went over a schedule, um, which would lead us to our presentation before the full anti-hate crime task force on November 9th. Uh, we talked about a community survey um, that would go out to leaders of API community serving organizations to get their feedback as we formulate these policy recommendations. And uh, then we also spoke about upcoming uh, past and upcoming meetings with government officials and um, cohort groups. I wanted to offer um, the opportunity for us to gather um, beyond these meetings, um, just socially, and it could be a mixer, which is just among us as AAPI cohort, or we can invite the entire task force. But I'm, I'm happy to host that and wanted to get your sense of doing that. And the reason why is because we had a Mocopan uh, community meeting, um, but weren't able to include all of the members of the, the cohort because some of the discussions related to the work as we were testing out um, the survey questions and just also getting a sense of um, community members' reactions to, you know, hate crimes in general. So anybody have any, any comments about whether you'd like to see such a social mixer happen or not? I'm um, in favor I, for, and for either formats. Um, yeah. So thank you for hosting and offering. Likewise, I'm in favor. I second I'm in favor it. as well. Okay. Okay. So, so shall we, um, you know, offer to invite everyone together uh, to get a chance to meet each other beyond our group? I mean, we could even have two if you want. You have a, a smaller cohort meeting and then a larger one. But I, I just wanted to throw that out there because I know we haven't had opportunities to meet in person except for that first meeting. I would love an opportunity to meet with the whole cohort just because I feel like we don't really have a time to actually be together outside of the formal meetings. Um, and it could also be like, hey, if we wanted the smaller cohort to give extra time, we could add in 30 minutes ahead of it or what have you. Um, but I would, um, if you'd only have one, I would greatly appreciate more time to spend across the cohorts because I think that um, collaboration um, and and um, knowledge of each other just kind of fosters more collaboration. Okay, does yeah. anyone share that idea or have a different? I, yeah, I, I agree. I think we should just open it up to uh, the full task force if that's what you're asking. Um, anybody can, you know, can join if they, if they have the time rather than just uh, keep it uh, just among the API cohort. Hi, welcome, Jeff. Uh, we're talking about whether to have a social mixer that would involve the API cohort only or to open it up to a larger task force, just so that it's an opportunity for everyone to meet each other. Uh, I mean, if I mean, if logistics work out, I figure the more the merrier. <laughs> okay. Okay, well then, um, May, I will lean on you to help us find a date. And or at least us you. or the whole, like pulling us first or pulling the whole group? Um, we, we can talk about that off offline, okay. but it could be sort of both. Okay. 
Yeah. Will do. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so moving on to the substance of the agenda. Um, today, we will be, we had planned as a goal by the end of this meeting to discuss the ideas on the Jamboard. As you know, we had brainstormed about 64 ideas and categorized them along three different categories, which were youth and schools, API community, and then cross community slash solidarity. Um, before I forget, I just wanted to let you know that um, I am in touch with the Asian Pacific Progressive Student Union um, leader who I mentioned had that policy platform. Um, I'm gonna be inviting her to attend if she's able um, tomorrow at tomorrow's meeting, since we do have back-to-back -back meetings. If she's unable, then I will see if we can um, arrange to have a separate meeting outside of um, our, our regularly scheduled meetings to get um, their input. Um, and we wanted to start to narrow ideas if possible. So um, let me also just do a quick readout before I turn it over to Juan. And um, I mentioned last week that, you know, Mokopan had a social mixer and because of the timeline and trying to get the survey out, we thought that we would test the questions, um, you know, among the people who did attend just to get a sense of whether the questions were clear, uh, whether the survey was too long, um, those kind of mechanical questions. But we also wanted to test the waters. And so we did have a facilitated conversation. And thank you to Karen Lynn, who's a Mokopan member, um, who facilitated a conversation about, you know, what are where do where are people's sense in terms of, you know, the recommendations that they would like to um, proffer if they were in our shoes. And that gave us a sense of uh, what the community might say um, in the surveys <laughs> at large. So I um, wanted to focus your attention here on the middle um, panel, which is where we brainstormed ideas. And, uh, you know, there were numerous of them, but there was no big surprises. They fell along, you know, um, you know, the clusters that we saw ourselves in our own jam board and basically what it came down to in terms of themes were these. So um, common, uh, common conversation topics that we've had before, API representation um, in the policy discussions is, is lacking and therefore there's an interest to raise public awareness, um, which you know, calls for more data and research, but also funding of API serving organizations to enable the staff to provide community education or competency training um, to represent, you know, the different ethnic communities and, and elevate their voice um, because we are still evolving as uh, in our advocacy capabilities. Um, there, like has been resonated across the country in interest in API ethnic studies, K through 12, in um, college and universities, um, as well as the community at large, um, specific to hate crimes. There was discussion about a 24 seven hotline. One thing that did come up that was really interesting is that there's actually um, a, con a county number, phone number that is in reserve um, that can be used for hotlines for um, the API community members or any other uh, community members to call in and report, you know, a hate incident or or a hate crime. So just wanted to let you know that that is um, that is actually available. So operationally, that's there for the for the taking. Um, I mentioned API community serving organization support. That's individually for the organizations and also to you know, bolster a larger community coalition um, to represent the different ethnic uh, community groups, since there are you know, 50 ethnic groups in the API community, um, to involve youth and also to strengthen our capacity um, to be a better ally as well. So these are just sort of the general themes that arose from the discussion that we had on Saturday. And I just wanted to, to share that. Were there any comments or questions about this readout? 
Um, Ariane, so this is this from both our GM board and from the session on Saturday? It's only from the session on Saturday. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so if there's no other questions, I will turn it over to Juan here. We are down here in our agenda. And Juan, if you if you could share with us the status of the survey that you and Karen have been working on, as well as you know the outreach plan, um, your goal in terms of the rate of return, the timeline, and any assistance that you need from our cohort members. All right, thank you, Ariane. Um, first, I do want to let you know that um, um, I did send out the latest draft of the survey to all the cohort members uh, around 7 p.m. today. Um, I, I sent one out last Thursday, uh, but very, it was very late, so I don't know if everybody saw it, but in regards, that was a very rough draft. So in regards to the status, you know, so I... I send it out and I would love to get your input. You know, I would ask every cohort member to fill it out, uh, time yourself, see how long it takes you to do it. And then uh, and then go back and see if there are any areas where we can improve upon. Um, I'd love to have those comments by tomorrow's meeting, uh, before tomorrow's meeting, because we have another API cohort meeting tomorrow night, right? So that'll be a good, good test. Uh, for us uh, internally before uh, we release it out. Um, it's, you know, we've already, Ariane and I and, and some others have already gone through it uh, a couple of times and uh, try to reword some of the things, but we're always open to comments and suggestions. And particularly if there's something not clear, right? Cause the key is uh, if, if it's clear, people should be able to answer it quickly, but if it's, you know, kind of has double meanings or whatever. Uh, it takes long, longer and more confusing. It doesn't provide the data that we want. So, um, so our outreach plan is, you know, we're reaching out to uh, API organization, executive directors, uh, board members, staff, and volunteers. So it's a very targeted survey. Um, and we hope, you know, to get uh, a rate of return, actually, I hear a rate of return of even like 30% is very good uh, for a uh, for a, a random survey. But since we're doing a targeted survey, I'm, I'm hoping we get a higher rate of response, uh, maybe 50%. Uh, that would be that would be ideal since we are trying to reach out to folks um, uh, individually. So so the plan is uh, to send the survey out uh, on so what, Thursday, okay? After we get uh, responses from you all um, and uh, incorporate any comments or suggestions and we'll send it out Thursday morning and uh, hope to get responses back from those folks um, within, within a week. Okay, so we we want to we don't want to give them too long of time. So we want to give them uh, a sense of urgency, so that um, at least if they see it, then they'll just uh, try to complete it. And and I ask for your help if you know members uh, of API organizations, especially uh, the executive director or one of the board members, uh, if you can help us reach out to them and ask them to fill out the survey, or you know, or pass it along to them. Uh, please let me know, um, and then uh, if you, you know, then I'll, I'll sign you up. We do have a list. We, I do have a sign-up sheet that I can post. Um, I think I'll put it in the, it's currently in a Word document, but I'll post it in an Excel format so that it's easy to fill out, and you can just pop your name in there and say, yeah, I can, you know, I can reach out to this organization. Uh, you know, I know Nazneen, um, We'll reach out to APA LRC because she's the executive director. And of course, I'll reach out to the executive director of the Maryland Vietnamese Mutual Association. But, you know, Nazneen, you also have board members and staff that perhaps uh, you can help us uh, get them to um, respond. Um, so I'm going to stop here and ask if there are any questions. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. well, and I had two, and that was to make sure you had all the emails um, for the list of organizations that you had brainstormed. They were a very good list. It was you know, a very diverse list. I don't have all the emails, um, but if, if you know, I, I was just planning to just Google them, Google them, uh, their organizations. And so well, if you put it into an Excel, maybe a, an Excel or a, or a Google spreadsheet, yeah. we might be able to go in and add in um, email addresses that we know of individuals who are on that. Um, I would also say like, you might want to reach out to Yishen um, as well, because he usually um, has, he has a lot of that information too that we're looking for. Right. No, I do plan to reach out to Yishen as well as um, the Asian American Health Initiative uh, Steering Committee. They have a lot of uh, active um, a API organizations that they can help us um, reach out to as well. Um, any other questions? Okay, and that is all I have. Uh, did you have another question, Ariane? No, no, I wanted to, to thank you and, um, you know, let us know as the days progress, because one week is very short, you know, how, how many surveys you're getting in return. So we'll know how much effort, you know, to expend to get those um, the surveys returned. And right. you might want to just, you know, if, if you can early on, let them know it's coming. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, maybe do a teaser or something. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, we have a very aggressive timeline. And um, and I do want to mention that, uh, again, Karen Lynn is the one who really helped us uh, uh, put together the survey from the list of objectives that we provided to her. And then, you know, we we um, edited some of the some of the wording, but I do want to give a lot of credit to Karen. Uh, yes, very indebted to her. Yeah. Thank you so much, Juan, for your work. All right, thank you. Back to you, Ariane. Okay, so now we're going to turn to government relations, and um, Jeff, if you could share your past meetings. I know you've had one with Lan Lan Shu um, from the Maryland Commission on Hate, at least. Um, yeah, let's um let's talk about the meeting we had yesterday uh, with Lan Lan, and then we can talk about our upcoming meeting with Jim Stowe. Um, so Ariana and I met with Lan Lan yesterday. Um, so Lan Lan uh, is the Howard County um, Commission head, but also is serving on the Maryland State um, Hate Crime um, body that's been formed under the Attorney General. Uh, that was enacted by legislation this past session. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to speak with her about was to get a sense of uh, what the state body's priorities are looking like. Um, they have their first meeting September 6th, and there were a few areas that we had conversation with, and there were a few, and I'll make sure to send these over to you. One was on language access. Uh, you know, there was a conversation on about different um, linguistic access. Uh, two, um, we spoke about I should say, uh, variation in hate crime reporting and data county to county. Uh, that's something that was notable and something that I think the attorney general is really um, trying to shore up. Um, three, um, the body is still trying to form their subcommittees. So that's something we definitely wanna stay apprised of. Um, she did highlight um, the upcoming forum next week, which I know a number of us are going to on reporting. Um, so I think that'll be a great opportunity. Um, given Lalan's, Lalan's background, we did speak about, you know, mental health and wellness and how that approaches some of these hate um, issues. Um, we had a I think really interesting conversation about curriculum, public schools and education, which also included uh, discourse about um, K-12 ethnic studies um, curriculum and agenda. This is, I know this has been legislative uh, action um on this in previous sessions that haven't gotten to the finish line i think this is something we'll continue um and then she did highlight um that other commission members of hers have spoke about um engagement with immigrant communities as well as um partnership um with police and i would say broadly speaking speaking about restorative justice um so i think we left it where you know 
as an entity for the for us here to see if we want to consider, um, you know, based on the conversations and priorities we have. At one point, we want to send over some thoughts that we might have to support some of her uh, insights um, for the commission. She is the only API member um, on the body. So that's just something that I think we left outstanding for us. We can talk about that. Um, but I thought it was a really helpful discussion just to understand that there is a lot of state and um, county interplay. And I do think that some of this will feed into, I think potentially some of our accommodations will feed into some of their perspectives um, programmatically and otherwise. So I just wanted to leave it at that. Um, tomorrow, Ariana and, and I are meeting with um, Jim Stowe. So we're gonna do a dive on what they're doing from you know human rights office perspective. And I think similar to see you know where where there might be some opportunities to see what we can enhance and support programmatically, policy wise, otherwise. So that's what I just want to highlight. Other meetings still outstanding, um, but my hope is that we'll get a few more on the board this month, early next month. Any questions? Okay. I I did have one question. So the state uh, commission. Uh, the state body, they they can they report to or they can provide recommendations to the attorney general. Yes, yeah, so be recommendations to the state attorney general, which will vis a vis be recommendations to the more administration uh, as well as the legislature. So, uh, but it'll be coming out of AG Brown's office. Yeah, thanks. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And, and so turning to Jeff's idea, I think he had interest in, um, you know, reaching out if there's time to the API uh, state caucus, the legislative caucus of API state lawmakers and, you know, sort of shaping the ideas that were discussed and shared with Lanlan into a list of um, priorities to share because of the interplay that Jeff had mentioned. Um, so there are some actions that can be taken at the state level that would, you know, impact um, on the county level. So for example, you know, uh, a, a funding bill for API serving organizations would really enhance the capacity of API community serving organizations. Of course, that could come from the county, but if, if that's available at the state level, of course, that would that would shore up the capacity further. So I think the question here is, um, even though this is related but not on point in terms of our charge, are we interested in compiling, you know, a list of of priorities um, as we do our work to share, in it, you know, for those meetings if we have those meetings. I would just also say too. I mean, um, in terms of you know, uh, Meredith, who has been leading the Jewish cohort for um, our task force is also serving on this commission as well. So there's, it isn't just sort of one point of opportunity to have conversations. I think there's probably multiple um, if we want to consider that road. Um, I think their charge will be heading into next year. Um, so if we wrap up at the end of November, there might be an opportunity to continue the conversation. Um, I also want to add that um, I currently uh, am a board member of the Asian American Political Alliance, and we have been partnering with um, the African American Chamber of Commerce and the Latino uh, or the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in Montgomery County uh, to organize what uh, is called a minority legislative breakfast, where we discuss legislative priorities. Uh, that benefit all three minority communities. Um, and, you know, that uh, if there are legislative priorities, we can certainly, uh, I can certainly present them um, to the group because we are still uh, trying to formulate the legislative priorities for the upcoming FY24 session or 2024 session. And Juan, because the theme this year is health, does it have to be related to health or can it be broader? It can be broader. Um, the theme, we're, we're still, uh, you know, discussing the theme. You know, in general, we have um, 
some areas that we we want to address. For example, economic um, development, education, safety is one. So I I think this uh, any recommendations out of our our cohort or task force could go under the, the safety um, umbrella. So, and of course, you know, it's it's also related to, to health, you know, physical safety. And then Juan, are you also still on committee for Montgomery? I are am. I opportunities am. to float ideas through there, that body yeah. as well. Yes, um, committee for Montgomery, um they have you know i guess six different areas that they uh look at to make uh legislative priorities and they're working on that and they have so committee from montgomery for those of you who are not familiar is composed of like 40 board members from from government organizations from nonprofit organizations from union representatives. Um, it's a very broad base coalition. And so it's, it's, um, th there's des definitely very interesting discussions on different topics, but the, the way committee from Montgomery makes its decisions on what legislative priorities we need to present or, uh, or, or advocate for, uh, we have to have like an 85%, you know, super majority uh voting yes for that so it, it's definitely a uh, very interesting conversations that we have okay what a resource thank you juan mm -hmm. um so if there are no more comments on that subject uh, then let's move on to coalition partners nazneen is there anything you'd like to share about um, previous cohort gatherings? So um, just to let you know, I did attend the, uh, the Muslim community meeting yesterday. Um, it was very interesting. Um, there were a number of community members that did speak. Um, a lot of it centered around students um, and schools, um, NCP, MCP, um, oh my God. Uh, public MCPS. Um, and so I think that, you know, when we are talking with our, but with what we have put down, I think um, it'll be interesting to see where um, some of the um, concerns that they had um, are raised within and challenges that would be raised with what we have already put down. Um, there were some comments, I, I will say that there were some challenges to some of the comments um, that I had just because of um, it was not you know, um, things that I would agree with. But um, again, you know, there were some, a few things that um, people brought up um, about how, you know, what what their children were going through. Um, and so I think that we have to be, I, I have to be cognizant, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, um, you know, there are certain things that we may put forth that other subgroups may not be um, as open to. Um, just because of, you know, of um, different, um, not different cultures and different um, 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 religious beliefs and all of that. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but I think that, you know, all, uh, uh, it was a very good meeting. I think that it really did highlight some of the concerns. And I think that it also showed me that across the board, there were, there were issues that, you um, each of the cohorts are going to are are sort of have in in, in common, um, and so I think that you know when we go through ours, I can talk to a little more about what what went on there at that meeting, um, and you know some of the things that they raised. And Ariane, I know you were there too, so I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I I was struck by some of the anecdotes. They were um, egregious some of them uh, consistent, where some of the members were consistently targeted and for their community involvement. Um, so that was a, a significant concern. One woman um, had sort of ongoing issues for about 10 years. And so her family was subjected, you know, to sort of the fear of, um, 
you know, even taking their family car out. So I think that's that's very gracious and it speaks to the need for us to coalesce together in, in order to support um, each other, even if it's just, you know, words of support, gestures of support will go a long way to, you know, sort of salve the wound um, for that individual in the family, but also the community at large, they don't feel um, alone. Okay, thank you, Nesneen. Um, so if there are no other questions about the cohort meeting, I, I also wanted to just sort of jump to the forum. I think um, someone mentioned this, but on September 19th, there's that regional hate violence reporting forum. There's another opportunity for us to get together and you can invite people who are not even in the anti-hate crime task force um, to attend that. Um, so let us move on to the meat of our meeting today. And Nazneen has uh, graciously accepted my invitation to have her review the ideas on the Jamboard, which relate to youth in schools because, you know, they carried over several different slides. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Nazneen. Do you have, would you like to share screen, Nazneen, or would you like me to in terms of the Jamboard? If you can share it, that'd be fine. So while she's getting that up, I just had a couple um, questions that I wanted to put out that I thought would help us with the um, with the conversation that that we're going to be having around youth and schools. Um, one is that there were, you know, when I was counting, there were a number of different ideas that we had put forth. Um, within the reactive, interventionist, and preventive um, spheres for both youth and schools. And one of my, um, you know, I think that one of the things I'm looking at is, you know, um, how many recommendations do we want to put forth? Do we want to, you know, because again, you know, some of the some of the ideas that I saw that I see um, encompass, you know, um, uh, you know, can be encompassed under different headings. You know, one is education. I think that throughout um, the, the different things that we put up, um, one of the things was education, education of the of youth and education of the schools. Um, um, and so, you know, the teachers, the principals. Um, so I guess my first question is, you know, how many recommendations do we want to make um, with regard to youth and schools since we have several different other um, categories that we're looking at of making for making recommendations? Um, and then the second thing is, you know, what are our, you know, um, what are the most important ones that we see for ourselves um, and why? So I guess my first um, going first is, you know, do we have a number that we want to put forth um, or at least just narrow it down to? Do we want to narrow it down to, you know, two for youth and two for schools? Do we think that they are both going to be um, similar that we can combine youth in schools. Hey, um, Juan here. So I I just wanted to get clarification uh, in terms of uh, priority recommendations. I think we, we were tasked to come up with like five recommendations. Is that correct in total? I believe, I believe so. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Got it. And so if you look like the topics that we have are youth schools that we put up, um, AEPI community and cross community. I don't know. Um, I don't know if we can do the five recommendations, but that under each, do we, are we able to have like subheadings or, or sub, you know, some comments on those. Ariane, are you talking on me? Yeah, yeah, I, I see from, from our, our friends and the county staff, um, might not to put you on a spot, but might you know the answer to that, whether, you know, beyond the five policy recommendations, whether that can be sub points. 
Um, from from my office, I'm sorry, I haven't been following this in our office, but um, maybe I don't know if Carmen knows. Um, I can text too <laughs> right now if nobody knows on here, just so that we have the, that information. Going I forward. feel like in one of the questions you asked Ariane, it was supposed to be five, but there was like a, I feel like a, a release valve of like you can have as much of indexes and appendices as you want. <laughs> Um, so if there's like a general uh, bullet point umbrella and then the, in the index there's like here's these sub bullets, that might be the way to go. Sorry that I disappeared for a second. My power went out. Oh, that's okay. Yes, I remember that they said appendices were fine. I, I think, let me let me share some thoughts if I may, Nazneen. Sure. Okay. Um, so there, there's been a lot of work um, by different organizations in schools. And so I feel like they've laid the foundation and because the policy recommendations that are gonna <clears throat> come from all the different cohort communities only um, narrow down to five, I'm almost comfortable that whatever recommendation arises from the anti-hate task force um, regarding youth and schools that you know, it, it will be a solid recommendation. And I look forward to helping the support implement that. I think for us, it's about any um, nuance or flavor um, to those recommendations that are specific to the API community. So I, I personally can um, feel comfortable that we are going to settle on at least one recommendation of the five that we're allowed as a cohort. But in terms of the community though, um, that is less supported. We don't have the community infrastructure and we need that um, individually for our organizations and then as a for community infrastructure to build coalitions to even begin to advocate for things like um, funding to even provide direct services um, to those affected party and um, to push for more data and research and, and, and effect just representation overall. So I, I would um, encourage more development of recommendations in that area. And then in the third category, which is the cross community one, um, I again anticipate one. So I, I don't know if that helps a little bit, Nazneen, in terms of you know the, the numbers, but to your question, I kind of see youth and schools so interrelated that I could see one recommendation with different sub recommendations under that one recommendation. Okay. So I guess, you know, when I was looking over everything, there were a couple of themes that I saw. One was mental health um, for youth, in, in, whether, you know, outside of school or within the school. Um, the second was um, education, educating um, youth on, um, on anti-Asian hate or, or hate bias in general, um, but also educating um, the staff the teachers, the, the administration on those on those topics. Um, and then the third was um, intervention, like, you know, how do we intervene? How do we how do students intervene when they see something happening? Um, so those are the three themes that I saw throughout um, the, the different things that we were um, that had been written down. I'm wondering because I don't have children. I don't have children in the school district. So I'm, I'm looking to you all, what are some of the themes that you see? What are some of the issues that you think um, out, of, out of what we've collectively put together that you think are, the, are important for us to um, talk about, to discuss and, and flesh out a little more? Has, um, has anyone had a chance to kind of go through the um, the list of demands, I guess, they call them list of demands from the uh, Asian American Progressive Student Union? Yeah, and there wasn't a long list, it was six things. Um, it was a curriculum inclusion, data disaggregation, professional development for teacher education, student support, staffing and hiring, and then funding and support for student community organizations. So I think there's some overlaps with um, what Nazneen shared. Um, I, I, and, and to your question, Nazneen, of like, you know, like I, I do have kids. I, I have a, 
a six year old, so he's in first grade and a middle schooler. Um, and I have also kind of like been informally chatting with um, a few friends who happen to be Asian teachers in the school system to see like what they're seeing, what they're noticing, what gaps are. So I haven't quite gotten responses to all of that yet. Um, I think uh, what it feels like, it like it depends on what school you're in, what resources and trainings you have and how and what working groups there are. And if there is resources, is it being consistently shared? Because just that one example of the app that I shared with the group, the MCPS, um, what's it called? MCS Student Stronger app that was de uh, developed by students so that um, it was supposed to be to connect students with crisis support resources or to, or to other mental, physical health, wellness needs, including the reports of incidents of discrimination. It was supposed to be like an easy way for students to just like report um, potentially anonymously if they wanted. Um, and that just happened to be mentioned at uh, a school orientation at our middle school. But when I checked in with other schools and teachers that I, I know, they were like, oh, I've never heard of this app. Um, so I just, that just seemed to me that um, some of the communication or it's not exactly consistent in terms of knowledge of what's even available. So it sounds like um, there needs to be more consistency throughout the county on what the resources are there are to assist students who want to report an incident but may not want to do it to um, in person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's just interesting that it was developed by students, so it seems to serve serve a need. But I don't know how much it's been. I think it was recently developed, so I don't know how much the word has gotten out there. Do any, is there, um, I know the one of the things I brought up was mental health services. And, um, you know, I think that um, I'm wondering if the schools, um, if the school has um, access to or or, or um, use mental health counselors that um, deal specifically with different populations. Because I think that um, API youth may have different concerns and different needs than um, someone who is from um, the black community or the, um, you know, or you know, the Jewish community because there are certain things that they may be going through or there may be certain cultural differences that, um, that are not, that are nuances. Um, so, um, you know, I think that um, I'm wondering whether or not that's something that the schools have, um, have, have, have um, resources for. So I've, I've done a little bit of work in the schools um, in past years. I also was a member of the Asian Pacific American Student Achievement Action Group, which was a parent advisory uh, group um, to the superintendent. And, um, and just as a, as a community advocate, supported parents in meetings that they had with different school officials. Um, so at that time, um, my observation was that they did not have sufficient staff. Um, and those staff that were on board did more pro programmatic work. But since I've learned that there has been, from, from the presentations that we heard through the, the full um, anti-hate task force, I heard there was a lot of hiring. Um, whether those specialists have knowledge of can speak um, languages of, of Asian American students, I don't know. That'd be something that we, we, could, we could ask for. Um, the other thing that I, I noticed is that there may be these resources, which you know maybe these um, counselors or the anti-bullying forum online, but the, the students themselves have to be socialized to the fact that they're available. And given the fast clip by which you know, students go through the day, it's, it is hard to um, impart that information and make that known. And uh, what I've seen is that they often go to like the nearest API teacher or faculty member or, you know, but administrator, but the, but the problem there is that that representation is also few, which speaks then to hiring and then recruiting. And when we dug deeper, the recruiting was um, mainly on the East Coast and not on the West Coast, where API graduates come from, or you know the API serving institutions are. So 
um, I hope that was sort of helpful in terms of context. If I may add, I feel like my observation is that they're understaffed just in general. I mean, I have to deal uh, work a lot with my, my, my daughter is on a, um, a 504 plan and just getting support for 504s and IEPs across the board seem pretty hard. And a lot of times it's like if, if they're not struggling academically, uh, uh, then they are deprioritized or um, you have to be able to spend a lot of money to prove that it's needed um, potentially outside of the school system. Um, so I don't think that there's probably enough, especially like linguistical access and the cultural understanding. I mean, I know from my background, it was definitely in my family's background. It's like, definitely just keep your head down. Don't complain. This stuff happens all the time. There's no use in reporting. Um, so I just, I, I don't, and, and even if it is reported, I just don't know if teachers know what to do with that information besides, uh, yeah, even if where, where's the proper place of like the consistent data collection um, that was mentioned earlier. So do you think that one of the key points is, um, one is the edu edu education th across the board for administrators and teachers on um, hate bias crimes and the uh, impact it has on different communities um, and specifically with AAPI youth um, you know, the different um, aspects that the different types of hate crimes that they experience or anti or aggressions or microaggressions that they may experience and reasons for not reporting. I mean, potentially, I, I do hear that they have been receiving trainings. Um, I mean, but I think the it's all in the details, like what are the trainings on um, that I don't know, but, but I have heard that there are trainings, there are definitely some um things in the curriculum is it enough and um i you know and it needs to be repeated um things get forgotten i just feel like uh it's hard because we're relying on on students in, i mean on the teachers in the school system they already have a lot on their plate so i'm also so cautious on that and i feel like it's going to be a lot of partnership like you know bringing others as resources to them um so i i think more is needed but um I feel like there's still like some um, something that's getting lost because what I'm hearing is there's training available, there's stuff that they're teaching in schools, but some of the behaviors that the teachers observe feels like we just talked about, you know, restorative justice and what what it would constitute hate, but then these things happen and like the dots aren't connecting um, based on some of the anecdotes that they shared with me. So with that, I mean, when you're when you're talking about um, the disconnect, it's it's the disconnect the students are having with what they're being taught and then how they're behaving. Uh, the for the examples that were shared, yeah, it was, um, you know, just, you know, the teachers observing like name calling, and I was like, well, we just we just talked about this, so why is this happening? And it's like they don't even they still don't fully understand the implications of some of these words that they're using um potentially um so i mean I'm, I'm, i was talking to this was in elementary middle school um examples that i have heard um so it it, it, it there seemed to be uh, um a little bit of question of like it's not necessarily getting through um that they're doing it but there's something that's like not landing so i don't know if it needs to be presented differently presented more often or what have you but um that was just, again just it's just an anecdote may can i ask you is it is it do you know if, if, if or if does anybody else know when youth are being taught about hate bias um and you know and the effects is it during a certain like are they only being taught at at um like a certain month like is it through you know and during apa heritage month we're talking about this and what's going on and and that's it it's not something that's throughout the curriculum i don't know for sure i, I don't get the sense that it's like necessary throughout the curriculum it might be like mentioned once or 
what have you, but I don't, I don't get this instead. It's like brought up again and again and again of like, how do you report incident? What does an incident look like? Um, it feels like here's this piece of a curriculum and then let's move on um, to, to, to not, the next thing. We it's need not to woven cover. in throughout the, throughout the different subjects or throughout the different times during the year. It's just one time, that's it. We're, you know, let's move to the next. So I'm wondering- This is relying on my kid to report to me. I, it's okay. <laughs> right? So it's well, not that nothing, like, so hey. Like, like, um, them, but um, but I, I, that's what I'm trying to have more conversations with the, the parents and teachers of like what they've been experiencing, um, just kind of informing within my network, but that's what I've heard through just different parent teacher meetings and things like that. So I guess, you know, one of my thoughts is, is that, and I don't know how other people feel, is that, you know, with regard to curriculum and with, with regard to teaching about hate and bias and hate and bias crimes and, um, and um, speech, that that is something that across the board for all youth is something that needs to be taught um, consistently and not just a you know one shot deal, but it should be um, part of the curric part of the curriculum throughout the year. With API youth, um, I think that you know um, some of the themes may be um, more on, um, and I don't know how other people feel about this, but um, on mental health and on um, and on reporting, because I do think that um, a lot of times, APA, APA, like you were saying, you know, APA, you know, told, don't, you know, don't, don't make waves, you know, don't, you know, don't say anything, you don't, it'll be fine, you know, or this is something, you know, that will go, you know, you, you have to deal with. Um, so I'm wondering if the recommendations that we make or the things that we should concentrate on are ones where, um, it's more directed towards AAPI youth and, you know, their response there, how they, how they respond to um, hate bias incidents that they're a part of or that they witness. And then um, something else that we should probably uh, I don't know, discuss is, you know, when, when something is reported, say by a student, right? Um, they're sometimes they don't want to report it. You know, if if we're telling them, yeah, you report it, but sometimes people don't want to report it because they're afraid of retaliation. Because the perpetrator, nothing happens to the perpetrator uh, sometimes, right? If 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 reported, I don't know. I don't know if there's you got to come up with some kind of proof or whatever. But if you don't, then the perpetrator is still there, and now they're vulnerable to retaliation. So that's another. Um, you know, challenge that that I think a lot of students, not only students, but I mean, I I think even adults uh, in the school system, you know, uh, they I I do hear stories that you know they there's certain things that happen to them, but they don't want to uh, API adults they don't want to do anything because they don't want to uh, you know get in trouble or get retaliated against or lose their pension, you know, whatever that leads to. So um, that that is a, a real fear uh, of, of retaliation. Um, Nazneen, my, my sense is that it's less about curriculum than it is about um, coming together you know, as a community and um, naming and actively shaping the school climate because there could be lessons, but those lessons won't sink in unless, you know, there are interactions and then pauses, reviews, and resets. And, and that takes a lot of staff time. And there, there are some, um, in, in the county, they're doing a yeoman's job, like the you know equity initiatives office. Um, but my sense is that because there's so few staff there, you know they they are sort of coming in in response to these incidents, right? And you know, is there is there enough? So I think it's about representation in the individual schools, 
and then support for the students even outside of the class class rooms that they feel like they have agency they have peer support they you know know where to get resources that they have these interactions with other you know students they do keep each other accountable um, but there's a continual sort of infusion of these principles and that people are are aware that they're living them every day as to po as opposed to like another lesson they could just shelve right after they've come out of it. Well, one more thing I'd say is, I mean, I think a lot of what's the focus is on the, the, the teachers and the students for, for one of those two people to act. And then you can see like me, I'm like, I don't know what's going in the school. And so like, I think communication could also be shared with parents. Cause right, like if, if my six year old experienced something, they tell me and I need to help them report it, right? Like, but if I don't know what that resource is, nothing's gonna happen. I'm gonna reach out to the teacher maybe. Um, and so I don't know if any of these trainings have included families. Um, because I mean, we know kids are influenced by their parents. And if the the family, if the parents are more willing to report it instead of have the resources and the, the parent has to have, have a, a role in it. I, I think it relies heavily on the student reporting what's happening uh, on their own. Um, so I, I feel like if um, some of these trainings could be ex uh, extended to like, or, and with just more information shared of what's even happening with parents as well. Um, I know like the PTA meetings that I've attended, I've been impressed that they do simultaneous translation into Spanish, Amharic and Vietnamese often in our elementary school. And, but I don't know like a lot of it is just like the logistics of school and things like that, but I, we, I don't, we don't get too much into, um, I, we, I haven't been to a meeting on this topic. I know in middle school, they've started having some of this, but not, not in the elementary school system. And that's where the hate crimes data, of course, saying a lot of these things are happening. And then, you know, maybe it's partially from ignorance of what they're copying from social media or TV, but not really knowing what it, they're doing. Jeff, we haven't heard from you, and I want to give you a chance to speak if you have something to um, to to share as well. No, I think, to be honest, I think that actually, <laughs> I think you all covered all the big ones, actually, now that I think about it. But if something else comes up, I'll let you all know. Okay. So I think that, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to work in my mind how do we make, how, what type of recommendation to make. Um, on youth in schools, because I think that there are so many issues that arise with students. Um, you know, I was talking about um, going to the the uh, meeting yesterday with the Muslim cohort um, and their community and within their community. Um, and it's I think that it's it's you know teaching youth um, or you know educating youth on hate bias crimes not only within their own community but how their, you know, their bias, biases and their thoughts may impact another community as well. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, and I think I, I agree with May's point that, you know, it's not just educating students and the teachers, but it's educating parents as well, and the community as well, because you can learn something in school, but if you go home and it's reinforced and something else is reinforced with you, then, you know, whatever you learn in school is going to be overshadowed. Um, so, um, I will take any, um, you know, any thoughts on how we can put one recommendation together, um, because I do think that, um, education, I think that, you know, I think that what a lot of time we're talking about is education and it's educating, um, the, 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 the youth, not only youth, but their parents, um, and, and the, um, schools on hate bias crimes. Um, the need, the the need to report the, the and and but but again, it's not only just the need to report these incidents, but it's how do we react to them? How do we what we, do we do if someone is um, does come forward and decides to report? What are the ramifications? What are the what are the steps that are taken to ensure that that one that that student feels safe and continues to feel safe, but two that the incident is um is you know is 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 so the person who perpetrated it is not, you know, I, I don't want to say punished because again, students say things and sometimes they don't understand and they're there for bringing in what comes from 
they get from their from their parents, but how do we make sure that there is some sort of education help done around that so that hopefully that incident will not happen again or that those that that type of situation won't occur again. I think if I were to kind of sum this up, I, I, I do hear very clearly the interest in um, providing more information and for um, parents, which means engaging the parents. Um, there, there, I have heard some conversations about difficulties in getting some Asian American parents, you know, engaged. I also have seen or heard um, of, of success. You know, there was a principal who's now retired who really got to know um, an Asian American parent community and um, so well that, I mean, she literally went to them one to one to one and found someone who's sort of a, a primary organizer. Um, you do have those in some of the staff with like these parent coordination, uh, I mean, parent coordinators there are not enough of them, there could be more. Um, I think there's one Chinese speaking one, one Korean speaking one, but that might be the extent for the Asian Americans and they're not always placed in you know, um, schools that have large API populations too, um, because they're just sort of based in one school and then they, they're roving, but there's constraints on that. Um, and then increased uh, representation of teachers, administrative staff, um, and just more ongoing training for the teachers as well. I know I've done trainings. Someone who's been to these 15 years told me it was the first time she had seen it, you know, in, in 15 years, um, but it had to cease because there wasn't financial support to keep that going. And that's part of the, the professional development offerings. Um, there's no requirement to attend. There's no requirement also to attend other certain um, meetings, celebrations during API Heritage Month. Um, I think that that is, it may be different, you know, um, with, with other celebrations. So I think there's a lot to, to look at. But the mental health, I wanted to raise up, Nazneen, because that has reached a crisis point. And there have been scores and scores of studies that have re received NIH funding um, on API, you know, um, the mental health of API community members and particularly youth. And uh, it, it's, it's reached a, a crisis point where we do need to ensure that families can access these culturally competent um, therapists locally. And I will say that I think that, you know, um, a lot of youth um, have, you know, part of it is an identity, you know, do, you know, who do you, how do you identify yourself? How do you, you know, are, if you are part of an ethnic community and you're, you know, um, you, you know, you're very admired in that, then you're looked at as being very different from other, you know, other, you know, who are, oh, you're not American, you're, you know, some, so in something else. And, you know, I think that a lot of youth have that identity crisis and that also plays into, um, making, you know, having to, um, having mental health issues that arise because of that. And it's not the only thing, but again, it's, you know, it's, I think it's, it's something that a lot of API youth go through, um, is how, how, how do they identify within their own community and then within the community at, at large? Um, I would suggest that, you know, um, maybe there are, um, you know, there are, um, you know, rec um, like there's a the, there's one recommendation that we make, but that under that there are certain things um, that I think that um, you know that that like a sub 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 recommendations that we make. Um, I think that the overall theme that I'm hearing and that that most people have been talking about is um, is the um, edu or, or um, and I don't know how to say it, but educating within within the community education within the community. Um, and so, you know, again, um, under that, it's, you know, understanding, um, you know, what is um, anti-Asian hate? Um, how do we respond to it? Um, yeah, and that's one thing, how do, how do you recognize it? How do you respond to it? How do you report it? Um, the second thing is, if you do, you know, 
um, what are some of the things that, um, you know, um, we, you know, what are the services that are that are there so that by recognizing that there need to be services um, for a youth that are culturally, um, um, you know, culturally specific to them and for them. Um, and that includes mental health services, um, um, which is a big part of it. Um, and then under that, the third recommendation is, or the third sub recommendation would be training um, for um, for the school system for the school um, on on different issues that affect AAPI youth. Um, and I hope somebody else wrote that down because I did not. <laughs> this meeting is recorded, though. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I don't know um, what you all think of that, or if I'm missing something, or I missed a bigger issue that we need to um, really focus our attention on. I I wonder if um, this is kind of a broad, you know, a broader uh, opportunity to do like a broader training not just with APIs, uh, community, you know, parents, students, um, but I mean, I think there needs to be some type of training for, in general, right, for everybody, everybody in the school. Um, and, you know, it would be great. And, and of course it has to be, you know, um, I mean, address the basic, the basic problem is, is, you know, people getting, um, you know, experiencing hate uh, or hate bias incidents um, because they look a different way or they talk a different way or act a different way. Increases they're different. So if we perhaps make a recommendation, one one of the like overarching recommendation, perhaps. Uh, at least, okay, if we're talking about the schools, you know, perhaps, you know, have a kind of a, a group that goes from school to school and have some sort of a, an assembly, right, for all the students and, you know, do a presentation, whether it's a, it's a video or whether it's a video accompanied by some, some live acting on what's what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, and I'm thinking maybe a video might be, might be better so that you can also uh, send it out on YouTube to the parents, like a public, you know, and then it can be used as a public service announcement. Um, and then uh, that way, it, you know, you can, you can reach a really broad spectrum of different communities. And then for those communities that, um, have limited English proficiency, uh, perhaps get funding to have the, that, uh, to have those communities get a budget so that they can do outreach in the specific language as it relates to that, you know, that type of education. You know, you, you have, I mean, you can't expect each individual organization to come up with their own um, education or training plan if it can be created, if one can be created, um, and then that that one can be used, right, by the schools, by the public, can it be aired on on television, on cable, TV, uh, on YouTube, on social media, uh, just get that message out. And then if you can have funding for different uh, API organizations that have different language challenges so that they can you know, reach out to their community with the same, with the same uh, training or or or, or uh, information, but in a in a culturally competent and you know um, language appropriate uh, way. Uh, I think that would uh, perhaps help help us reach out to not just folks in the API communities, but every community. Yeah, Juan, your idea reminds me of, you know, when I was in school, public school, and 
there would be organizations like Moms Against Drunk Driving and they would present before a entire school assembly. I actually remember those lessons, but I was such a Girl Scout that I don't know how it would land with today's student audiences, you know, um, but they were, they were memorable. Um, in addition to that, I think the support system that includes, you know, the parents, the teachers, administrators, peer support from the students themselves to attend to the school climate is that needs to be sort of this ongoing, the ongoing work, right? So that it's not reliant on the special visit before the school assembly. Um, so, so there's that. And this could be more, you know, cross community as well, because mm -hmm. it takes everyone. And, and then to have cross community resources broken down by uh, cultural competent, you know, therapists or school counselors you know, to attend to all different kinds of groups. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm hearing, how it's gelling. I will say that I think that um, there, these are all, you know, it's all, I think we all have a, a lot of good ideas. It's just sort of putting it, delving it into it, putting it to, into one um, solid recommendation. Um, that's going to be the challenge here. Um, I, I, I will say that I do think that, you know, there are, you know, because of we are the AAPI cohort, I think that, you know, with, when we're looking at youth in schools, I do think it goes across the board. But I also think that there are certain things that are certain items that are really specific to the AAPI community um, that um, need to be addressed, that should be addressed. Or, you know, and that, and I do think that one of them is, um, you know, the mental health issues that students are having um, because of various issues of identity and, you know, being, you know, being looked at, you know, saying, oh, you look different, you have this, you have that, you know, I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is um, having teachers be educated and administrators be educated on certain things. I think that one of the things that, um, you know, came up yesterday when we were talking was students who observe um, Ramadan and are fasting from the Muslim cohort and how schools look at that and how teachers have, comments teachers have made. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, and it's the same with the API community. If you, you know, um, if, if, you know, if you're like, you know, why are you, you know, why do you um, celebrate Diwali or, you know, Lunar New Year, you know, why, you know, and, you know, we're so used to people, well, Christmas is there and, you know, this is there and no one questions those holidays. But when you have a holiday, um, it is something that is brought up and like, well, that's, you know, that's a little different. Or, but, or why do you do that? I'm like, well, you know, this is how our families celebrate. You know, this is something that's within our culture. Um, and so I think that, looking at recommendations that I do believe that some of these do go do go to the cross community um, recommendations that we're looking at as well. But you know, when we're looking at youth, it's, you know, the the ability to understand that you can be different, but still be part of the community um, is one thing that I think a lot of youth don't see right away and that they really, um, you know, struggle with. Yeah, I think Ariana, you started off this conversation of like, you know, we're going to have a lot of recommendations that's going to be cross cutting um, across the cohorts. Um, but what is the thing that we want to elevate for the AAPI community? And I think Nazni just kind of mentioned one piece of that that I feel is true is that when we talk about race, a lot of times it's in the black white context and everybody else is kind of seen as like the forever immigrant, forever outsider. Um, and I think that's something that's unique to the AAPI experience of, right, right, like, where are you from? You're not from here. You don't automatically belong. Like, all of these, like, little instances that feel like you're not within the norm standard, American standard. Um, and so the, the education piece, like, promoting, like, I, I think we talked a lot about, like, we need the education on the, uh, to, to address the negative things, but also the education for the positive things of, like, the positive contributions AAPIs have brought to the US also has to be included in that and just um, underlining that we are Americans as well. Um, and like the Americans includes this wonderful Well, and that diverse some, system, some, so. You know, some within the, I mean, have been here for generations, um, you know, 
um, I, I, you know, um, I'm, I'm first generation here, but I know, you know, I have um, friends who are Chinese American who have, you know, they've been, you know, their generations here. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that is lost when we talk about the API community, it's, oh, well, you're a new immigrant. Well, I mean, even myself, I mean, I was born and raised here. My parents have been here for, you know, um, my mother's been here for over 60 years, but she's yeah. still perpetually going to be an immigrant. Yeah. And I think with the way I see that happening in the curriculum is like, I know they'll be like, oh, May, do you want to come in and talk about Lunar New Year or or this? And like, there's that one point. And it, it's again, it's like, you're pretty, it's not actually, an Asian American curriculum is like an Asian curriculum. Like here's this thing that, that that these people do over there, and it's not like here's what we do here, um, and and here's who, how, how our communities contribute. So, I I feel like even taking a fine look at some of the curriculum and how it's being implemented, because the way the way I feel like I'm being engaged as an Asian American parent is, well, what what country do you represent, and will you cook this thing? Um, or this one day of school potluck or what have you. Yeah, so I guess the question is how do we decipher what we want to put in for youth and schools versus what recommendation we want to make that would go to cross communities? I was wondering, Nazi, I feel like you have a, like, a lot of good stuff and it's like, how do we boil it down to the thing? And I don't know if it's helpful Again, I think I've kind of said earlier on, this is like the the one area that I'm, I care about at all, but this is the thing that I really, really care about. So if it's helpful to set up a separate meeting to like workshop together more. Um, and also to just like, you, May. and I know I just need time to just like look at the words and honestly rewatch the video, video of the last 15 minutes to be like, what did we say? <laughs> um, to try to like wordsmith it. And it just takes yeah. me time to iterate on that. So, um, I, the rest of the cohort is in agreement. Maybe May and I can meet offline and put something together and um, bring it not tomorrow, <laughs> but what in one of our next meetings on youth and, and schools and at, you know, or youth and education, I guess we could say too. Um, I see Joy has her hand up. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I get a formal say or whatnot, but just to throw an idea out to you guys as well as I'm listening to things as well. And for me, like my heritage is Japanese and Chinese and part Native Hawaiian. So I feel like I fit all the AAPI segments as well. And I didn't grow up in Montgomery County, um, but I did grow up in Hawaii. And so Hawaii has its own, you know, unique um, sort of identity um, and so forth. But one thing I know that does speak to a lot of APIs is that we do feel more comfortable with um, the API community. And so I really resonated when Ar Ariani kind of said in the beginning part that API, stu API students, when they want to report something, they do seek out another API adult or so forth. Um, and that speaks to the need for representation in API um, faculty and staff. And so just kind of thinking along thoughts on either maybe a policy recommendation could be along the lines on, well, you know, we all know we need diversity, but here's another reason why we need diversity in our faculty and staff. Um, alternatively is actually designating um, in each school, um, like if possible, like somebody um, um, is the designate API individual where if you are a student and you want to report something, there's an actually adult in the school who's trained and knows how to um, report something in. And so that could be just one idea. Um, and that kind of speaks to all the different other cultures as well. But I do know for API specifically, it does tend to be a little bit more that we feel comfortable with an API individual. And it doesn't really matter either if you're Japanese reporting to Japanese person or whatever. It's just that API identity does kind of resonate a little bit more strongly with us, but would it be helpful for everyone else? So just a thought, <laughs> but um, I appreciate everything that you guys are saying, um, sharing. I'm really learning a lot. This is one of the more fun uh, meetings I get to attend for work. Thank you, Joy. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Um, it, you know, if it's helpful, I can also concretize these into like specific sort of, you know, anecdotes that I've seen with students, just as you guys are, you know, um, thinking about policy recommendations. Um, what resonated to me is I, I did meet a student who, um, despite, you know, the large Chinese American population in certain districts here in Montgomery County felt isolated. So I think 
um, that student would have benefited from exposure to Asian American studies um, or more conversations about Asian American history. Um, one thing I tried to do at APISAC is to broaden API Heritage Month beyond like the, the folk, you know, culture kind of celebrations to more, you know, what has Asian Americans, how long have they been here? What have they done, contributed, that kind of thing. Um, I think cross ethnic studies too. Um, there was there was a student who was bullied and he stayed Asian American student, he stayed silent for a year. And then when he finally um, lashed out, and it, well, it wasn't a, a racist inappropriate way, right? But that is what was manifest. So he was suspended. The other students were not, right? So cross ethnic studies, as well as again in the school, having that anti um, bullying program. So there's the school assemblies that Juan talked about, or maybe there's exercises, support for student groups, you know, maybe cross student group um, activities that requires faculty, faculty that represents the diversity of the students. So we need more Asian American um, faculty. It is true that the students need to recognize bias. There was one student that I heard, um, he was in a, in a, in a locker. Um, you know, this is not this is outside the school, but for swim team. And um, during the height of the COVID, um, another student joked in, in the locker room where there was many other Asian American swimmers and said, you know, those of you from China should be gassed. I'm paraphrasing. It's, it's something along, you know, those lines. Um, parents also need to know where to go to assistance. Um, my experience is that they've gone to the community leader within their community. And then the community leader will call me as, because I'm the bridge, you know, I, I might not be the immigrant, the one that they see as being, um, able to navigate systems. So you could always create these daisy chains, like who do the parents trust, you know, and they're, they are more apt to trust like the Asian American teachers, you know, principals, community leaders. So I, I do like the idea of, of they're getting training or more parent coordination coordinators. I forgot what they were called, you know, all of those. It doesn't have to be just one designated um, type of staff or community leader, but we do need a number of those um, resources and to refresh often. There's really great resources from um, the Equity Initiatives Office, and that includes APIs as well. But again, it's, it's one of those things where you have to make it come alive, right? Through some planned activities, cross um, conversations. They, do, they did have this in, in terms of um, study circles, when they were talking about the achievement gap, maybe it's time to kind of borrow from that, you know, and have more cross-race um, conversations. But I think the bullying is also just kids not knowing um, what is appropriate behavior. That's part of a maturity issue as well. Just more, more adults to kind of help um, manage that. And then for the teachers and administrators, definitely to recognize um, some of the challenges that the students have. Um, there are, I, I, do, I did hear things where students would say, I'm piping up all the time, but I'm also downgraded for not speaking up. So I feel like I'm always hitting up against this model minority myth that I'm too quiet, but ex excelling, but I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to speak up. I'm not recognized for that. So, you know, again, I, I think the professional development piece, but overarching is the mental health piece. Overarch I had this one girl and she wrote a suicide note and um, her parents weren't told for four days. Uh, and she got sort of bumped around through different um, um, hospital and health settings, but her parents were, were, were immigrants. They were um, low income workers and they could not understand um, the decisions that were made on behalf of their daughter, they ended up returning overseas. Um, and uh, unfortunately, one of the parents committed suicide because the parent couldn't deal with that. And so that family came back and is in Montgomery County again. So I, I wonder, because I'm always trying to find therapists who are in language and I've called different agencies 
they're growing in number, but they're also cost prohibitive. Um, so that's another sort of issue. And what do you do um, when it's, it's an emergency? It's a very cute case. I think that also brings up a point that, you know, um, that we see a lot of it as that within the AAPI community, a lot of times they, uh, parents don't want to, rec don't want to um, say that there is a mental health issue. It is, it's very much looked down upon. And I think that's hard. It gets harder when, you know, it's, it's, you're young and you're struggling with things and, you know, it is what you're feeling is downplayed. Um, within your within your own family because it's something that it's not something that's you know it's seen as acceptable to have a mental health issue um, you know and so I think that again when we're talking about youth and recommendations um, I think that sometimes the schools are the ones that first recognize or will um, come forward and say you know there there are some issues here that need to be dealt with um, but we don't, you know, so I think that the education piece comes back because I do think that parents need to be educated on um, these issues and how, you know, if something is not treated or if somebody is experiencing something, you know, a mental, a mental breakdown or a ment has mental challenges that how that can affect them if it, they're not, if they're not taken care of. So um, I think I, what I would say, because um, I know we don't have a lot of time, I'm sorry, is that May, maybe we can meet offline um, and put something together for the task force to review um, at one of our later meetings, if that is acceptable to the other members. Okay, thank you very much for the discussion. I appreciate it all. Yeah, thank you, Nazneen and May for the work that you're gonna do. Thank you all for being here and um, moving our, our work forward and um, for the staff for supporting us. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, good night, everybody. Yep. Don't forget to fill out the survey. Gotcha, Han. Good night. <laughs>